I didn't want it to be heroic. I didn't want him to be Iron Man snapping his fingers and saving the world. Uh, and, and I know a lot of people wanted that and I get what, why they wanted that. Like I've experienced a lot of stories like that that have been very satisfying. It's just not what we were going for. From the get go, all of our discussions were like, he can't go out in a blaze of glory. Welcome to Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies. Each episode, a brilliant screenwriter revisits their initial screenplay for what became a beloved movie, discussing what changed, what didn't, and why, from first draft to the big screen. Or at least that's what we normally do. Today, in the final episode in our 2021 awards season mini-series, we're delving deep into this year's BAFTA Game Awards Game of the Year, The Last of Us Part 2 with director Neil Druckmann and co-writer Hallie Gross. If you've played this emotionally devastating survival thriller, you'll know exactly why we wanted to cover it on the show. Set in a post-apocalyptic America that's been brought to its knees by a parasitic infection, the game caught up with teenage survivor Ellie, five years after the events of the first Last of Us. What begins as a tale of revenge eventually gives way to a profound meditation on the futility of violence, split into an ambitious two-part structure that forces players to empathise with the so-called enemy. There's a reason why it sold over 4 million copies in its first weekend alone on release last June. The Last of Us Part 2 is a masterpiece in storytelling, full of brilliantly realised characters and sharp observations on who we are and who we could be as a society. I caught up with Neil and Hallie to hear about how they wrote the game, turning back the clock to an early open world iteration of The Last of Us Part 2 that had a very different ending. Across a fascinating conversation covering as much about this 20 hour plus game in 40 minutes as humanly possible, we discuss the parts of their own lives they drew on to tell this story, the theme building advice of author Robert McKee that helped shape The Last of Us, and how a single detail in their first draft of the game's final scene almost cast the future of the franchise in a totally different light. Speaking of the future, you may want to stick around till the end of this one for some tantalising updates on a potential Last of Us Part 3, as well as the upcoming HBO TV series based on the first game. This is of course a spoiler-filled conversation, so if you're yet to play this astonishing game, I really do encourage you to hit pause now, grab a copy on PlayStation today, then, whenever you're recovered from the terrifying Rat King sequence, you'll know it when you get to it, come back as we delve into every detail of this phenomenal game. Thanks for tuning in to this awards season miniseries. It's been such a blast to make. We'll be back soon with season two of the show. Till then, you're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Hallie, Neil, welcome to Script Apart. It's almost a year now since The Last of Us Part 2 was released into the world. Now that the dust has settled a bit and you've had a little bit of distance from the intense creative whirlwind of writing this game, and in your case, Neil, directing it as well, how do you look back on the incredible story you're able to tell? Is there anything about the world and these characters that you've come to see in a different light at all since? I mean, there's things you write. It's it's when you work on something like this, especially when you work for so long, you definitely lose the forest and the trees. Um, and all you could do is like look at the plan that you made. You know, we Hallie and I worked very long to have a, a strong outline that gave us like um, a path, a, a, a journey of how to execute this thing. And then towards the end, right, you're just seeing like, well, I could, we could fix this, we could fix this, we could fix this. You do a round, you play the game, you're like, okay, we could fix this, we could fix this. We can't fix this anymore. We're out of time on that. We can't reshoot a scene. <laughs> like you just lose options of things you could address as the further you get into production. Uh, and then the thing you never know is, well, how are people going to react to any of this? Um, and now seeing right the the full spectrum of reaction to the the thing we've we've made, um, it's 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 gratifying to see how many people picked up on small things that we weren't sure anybody would ever read into, and even some stuff that you're right is our subconscious maybe working beyond the outline we've even created, uh, and finding connections in. Um, you know, we, we worked very hard to create these parallel stories that mirror each other. And uh, there's so many things I don't know if we consciously intended to be mirrored. And then people found connections between these characters and, and these this, these plot points. Um, so it's just I, I haven't played the game since it launched. Um, I'm, I'm still too close to it, even though you said it's been a year. Like it took me, I think, five years before I could play the first game. 
um, and then to just be removed enough. I think right now I'm still too close to many things and the conversations around those plot points for me, for me to play it again. So, but I am enjoying reading articles, sometimes jumping in the threads and seeing people talk about it, sometimes argue about it. Um, and that's been fascinating. And that's the thing that I was very much looking forward to before we launched the game. Um, okay, I rambled enough. Hallie, your team. I mean, sort of like Neil, like I haven't played the game since it came out. And in fact, when I when I hear Gustavo's music now, I feel like, oh, I have more notes. I have to like there are more I have to note more scenes, you know, if they're like <laughs> there are more things that I still have to do. It's like this Pavlovian um, got to get it in under the wire thing. Uh, so I haven't played it as well. And to Neil's point, my experience of the game now is is wholly from the players and their experience. And it's been really gratifying to to hear how it's had had a um, resonance with so many people. But I don't think there's anything that I sort of reflect on the game differently. I think we bit, we were in that game. I was in that game for four and a half years, Neil, for even longer. And I, it, it's just part of my DNA now. Like, I just know it so well that, um, yeah, it's it's kind of nice to, to sort of give it to somebody else sort of done i've like cooked the baby like no the the baby's yours now Put it up for adoption. About cooking babies <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the only uh, thing that Monday. hasn't come up in the last of us quite yet Maybe that's something for part three give us time <laughs> so i mean neil you touched on the reaction to this game and obviously when when you are crafting a story to an extent you can prepare yourself or predict a reaction but you couldn't have predicted the context that the game would eventually arrive into. So The Last of Us Part 2 did become a refuge for so many people, myself included, in lockdown. And, uh, you know, I know I found so much reflection and resonance in the story. Um, I, I wanted to ask, though, what your emotional state must have been this time last year as your release date was nearing and the scale of the crisis in front of us with COVID was becoming apparent because, well, beyond just the, pract the practical questions like how do we finish this game? Can we finish this game? You guys had spent years meticulously crafting a story set in a pandemic ravaged world. Were there any dark nights of the soul this time 12 months ago where either of you were secretly wondering, is this the right story to be telling right now? I guess I never had that question, um, which is, is this the right story? Because it felt like maybe if we were making the first game, which was about the outbreak and the fallout of the outbreak, um, this is, to me, it's like much later and like society starting to get rebuilt. And, uh, you know, it's this more personal story about um, justice and retribution. So I could see how on the outside that would be a concern. But for us on the inside, that wasn't a concern. The bigger concern was like, can we even put out this game? Because as COVID started hitting, um, we had to, we didn't, we weren't done with the game. Um, we still had a couple of months to go of production. Uh, so then um, we have to work from home. Um, within a week, our amazing IT department was able to like get people set up. They got a few, a handful of people set up just to test it. And then pretty soon the whole company is working from home and we're trying to finish this thing. And this is where like, it's hard to isolate just how I felt about COVID, because as soon as we did that, that we delayed the game indefinitely, there was a wave of negativity coming at us because we had already delayed the game twice, I believe, at that point. So people were just really upset. They're like, we're never putting this game out. So, like, you know, some of our most loyal fans were not happy with us, even though it was completely out of our control as far as how long we have to sit on a game before we released it. And then that was coupled with we were hacked and people... Yeah. Um, took videos off of our network and posted them on YouTube. So the story we've been protecting for years, we're now like the worst kind of spoilers were out there. And again, out, and of, out context, of context, yeah. there was another wave of negativity. So that was a pretty low point in my life was um, despite everything that's going on with COVID and, you know, I have kids and like trying to like take care of them. Now they're doing like a lot of learning from home and all that. It was just such a turmoil of emotions um, that, again, the, the best thing I could do for the, the game was just, OK, focus on the work that's in front of me. We still have some level reviews. We still have some notes we have to address, bugs we have to squash. Just keep focusing on the few things that are ahead of you. Don't listen to the noise because, again, there's so much negativity out there. At that point, you're wondering, is this game ever going to come out? And if it does, is it even going to be successful? Just because it felt all the noise was so negative around it. Um, that then it was a nice 
turn twist, you know, to get the positive reviews that we got for game to be as successful as it was, you know, it was, we're profitable from day one. Um, and it just felt like a, a moment of relief because it was, there was so much tension and st- like, it's, I can describe it. It's so hard to finish a game without all that stuff. Like, <laughs> yes. right. Cause you have all these insecurities. You don't like you, you feel very strong about the story writing, but you don't know, you have no idea how reviewers, gamers, how anybody out there is going to react to it until it's actually out. Um, so that's hard. And then to add everything on top of it um, made it that much harder. And I would say that, turn it into one of the hardest productions we've ever had. Maybe Uncharted 4 gives it a run for the money for different reasons. Um, yeah, so to answer your question, releasing under COVID was extremely, extremely hard, but I, I can't separate it from all the other circumstances that were happening around the launch of the game. But as it happens, of course, people did find solace in part two. I mean, there is hope in this story as, as well as darkness, isn't there? Yeah, no, we get letters all the time um, about people that it's always surprising to me because the first game and this game are pretty dark in subject matter. This game, obviously darker, um, but people, you're right. They, they do find hope and relief. And sometimes they're just going through like a really hard time. They have a bout of depression and something about the characters, you know, going through grief themselves um, it allows that it's a sort of release, a cathartic release of playing this game and going on this like, you know, painful journey that these characters are going through. Um, so that's always inspiring to get those letters, to read those notes, to like sometimes listen to a podcast, listen to someone that just resonated with the material in the way that we intended. Um, that's the fuel. That's the thing that makes us want to go forward and keep pushing our storytelling. I was going to say basically the exact same thing as Neil, but like the thing that surprised me was when COVID came out, I'm like, I get why we're all playing Animal Crossing. I get it. Me too. (laughs) We all need this right now. We need to feel like safe and in control of our little islands. So I had the same sort of concerns of like, this is a really dark, heavy game in a dark, heavy time. Is it going to be fatiguing? Um, And the amount of people for whom like that was surprisingly what really helped was to see people in worse circumstances overcome the difficulties they were dealing with or something that mirrored that that vibe for them um was was surprising and and wonderful for us that we could we could be helpful during such a such a drama time for everyone it's a story about the futility of hate the corrosiveness of obsession and the perpetualness of violence how it never leads anywhere um i was listening to a james cameron thing the other day where he described how the child is the father of the man so for him all of his movies have themes that he's able to pinpoint as being born out of these different formative experiences from his childhood are, are there moments from each of your backgrounds that you think informed what you brought to the table thematically with part two Wow, way to get personal there, Al. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess it's such a big game. There isn't like one main theme. Um, you know, obviously re- revenge is, is a big part of it. But, you know, earlier we we're talking about grief. And, you know, I know Hal and I were both and many people on the team were drawing from moments where we felt grief or we felt it was insurmountable. And then likewise, you know, I, I've talked a lot about, you know, I grew up in the West Bank in the Middle East in Israel. And obviously that I, I grew up in a culture that very much um, constantly is a, in a conversation about the cycle of violence. Um, and, you know, and when you're growing up and you're obviously just viewing mostly one side of, of, of a conflict, you see it on very simple terms. And as you get older, you realize there's many more nuances to it, to the conversation. It's much more complex than how you initially understand it. And usually people outside that aren't living in it view it very simply. And then the more you research, you understand the complexity of it. And there's something about that that was important to me to start with a conflict that felt very simple. Um, Someone has done you so wrong, you just want them to feel the pain that you felt. Uh, And then over time, hopefully kind of like for the player, uh, like um, pull back the curtain and reveal more and more of the complexity of what's going on, whether it's between Ellie and Abby or the um, Seraphites and the WLF, um, that these characters also have these sort of revelations of like, I I thought I understood my life and my life is actually more complex than that. Just doing this one act, this one violent act doesn't make things better necessarily. 
doesn't mean it's wrong. doesn't mean you shouldn't pursue justice. It just might not be this complete release you want it to be. Um, so that's was the hope of like, as people experience the game, they have a very simple feeling that becomes more and more complex the further you get into this journey. Yeah. So my, my angle coming into this is kind of different. So I've had PTSD twice and had to sort of reconcile with that. And so for me, this idea of, of engaging with trauma and the effects of trauma and this idea of you can head in a self-destructive direction and that's very uh, that feels good in the moment, that feels righteous in the moment, or you can take the harder road and try and say, okay, I'm not going to be the same person I was before this trauma, but this trauma doesn't have to define me either. How can I use what I've experienced to help somebody else or to help myself? Um, and so looking at sort of Ellie's disintegration because of her trauma versus Abby's ascension because of um, learning from the mistakes of how she's dealt with her trauma um, for me, that was the very personal narrative that I was very excited to put out there for people to sort of say like, hey, you know, we don't have to be defined by the horrible things that happened to us. But like, let's not pretend that there we can just move on. Um, it's it. The temptation is to be pulled under. And how do we how do we tread water? So that's what emotionally you were both bringing to the table when it came to writing this game in terms of craft and the storytelling sensibilities uh, in both of you that led to this story. Neil, you're a big Robert McKee guy, right? I mean, w- was there a particular... <laughs> <laughs> this is that. a fight uh, we always have. The old Robert a, McKee look, versus look, Blake Snyder. He's a Robert McKee, I'm a Blake <laughs> Snyder. We fight about this constantly. I'm ready to go. I didn't realize it had to be one or the other. It doesn't. Well, it does if, in if this talk writer's to, room. Uh, Craig Mazin, he'll say we're both idiots and we shouldn't read either one of those things. <laughs> I really like K.M. Wyland and Matt Bird, too. I think they're great. <laughs> awesome. But I mean, um, well, Neil, was there a particular McKee quote or lesson that, uh, you know, steered, steered your storytelling when it came to The Last of Us Part II? I, I, I mean, I, I guess it sounds so obvious now but you know like it's the one that always sticks with me is like you know the more pressure you apply to a character um the harder the choice they have to make the more you reveal their true character and that's where it's like that's what i i love about you know the the characters we've crafted is like you look at like ellie's journey and it's like she's so strong-willed um she's this idea of like that she comes from a culture of honor, like someone has wronged her and she has to make it right. And yet when you apply enough pressure, there's an altruistic side of her to her that, you know, at the, at the end of the day, couldn't spoiler alert for people listening to this. Uh, <laughs> when, it, when it comes to the end of the journey, it's like, this is the thing she's been fighting for all along to kill Abby for whatever reason, and there's a bunch of reasons there that she doesn't do it. And it's it's this razor thin margin of like, under different circumstances with like a little less pressure, she might've done it. Uh, but this is ultimately her true character. And this is like one of the things we wrestled with for much of the production, should she kill her, should she not? And we had both, well, we had many different endings to the story, but um, that's the one we wrestled with the most, I would say, before we finally settled on like who Ellie truly is. And that's, once you know that, and this is another thing that Robert McGee talks about, like you can't really know your story until you know it's ending. And it's like once we like fully committed to that ending, then it was about working backwards and restructuring certain things to like make make that point as honest as possible for Ellie. Mm. And how about for you, Hallie? Because obviously you came in fresh to Last of Us Part Two. You weren't involved mm-hmm. in the first game. What was mm-hmm. it about the story and characters that Neil had already created that chimed with the types of stories that you naturally gravitate towards and the types of characters and perspectives that you like to place in those stories? Uh, I can hit a few of those at once. It's like so many and I'm excited to answer all of them. Let's see if I can, let's see if I can do it efficiently. So <laughs> I, I love writing about women. I love writing about women in trauma. Um, for me, that's really exciting. And also this idea that like, we're only recently really seeing in media this how violence is translated with women as well right usually you don't see women who have serious anger issues who have impulse control issues you're you know it's 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 a way so so for me seeing the last of us and sitting down with neil and him going here are the temples of this story that i want to tell and he had the big inciting incident he had a different ending but like a lot of the stuff is as it stands now, 
I was excited to be able to say like, yeah, let's fucking talk about, am I allowed to curse? I'm so sorry. Yeah. Go for it. Let's talk. Okay. Let's fucking talk about um, <laughs> this story about these women dealing with these issues. And then he also, this idea of flipping perspective in the middle of the story, there was just such an exciting narrative challenge to say like, look, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to heavily Blake Snyder this. We're not going to give you a big save the cat. Like you should fall in love with Abby after all these horrible things she's done. Like we're going to make, we're going to stick to who she is honestly and like try and earn that, that empathy back. That was really exciting. And also he showed me a picture of the character model for Abby. And I was also just really excited to be a part of a studio that wanted to show diverse characters, diverse body types, um, you know, characters of different faiths, characters of different orientations. To me, the fact that Naughty Dog continues to try and be so inclusive, um, it felt like they were doing something really important and I just wanted to jump on board. From what I understand, um, there was an early iteration that coincided with, with your entry into the game uh, that had a much more open world feel. I believe Joel mm. had a Joel had a girlfriend called Esther who ended up being cut from the story. There were scenes Oh, that, Esther. Yeah, RIP. Yeah. There were scenes that didn't end up in the finished game set in a plantation and an oil rig. And all importantly, the mm -hmm. incredible structure of the game that you eventually landed on, that wasn't yet in place. Um, right. Is that a good overview? Is that about how things stood when you came on board? I would argue that we do have a plantation kind of style thing now. Um but yeah, the oil rig is true. Esther is true. Um, there were, uh, the, it was much more, yeah. When we started, do we have, we had like a big open world thing that we were trying to accomplish and see if we could play with it. Yeah. So, so a lot of that stuff, but we did have the inciting incident. We had at the end, Ellie kills, are we allowed to talk about spoilers? Oh yeah. yeah. Kills, oh yeah. Okay. Ellie kills Abby at the end. Um, but Neil always had that big flip in the middle. Um, that really jazzed my heart. And we should talk about that flip because, I mean, it's so novelistic, the structure, and it, it's also kind of true to the duality of the story you're telling. It makes sense for this story to be broken into almost mirror images because it's a story about both love and hate, hope and horror. Um, what was, uh, yeah, what was it about that structure that did jazz you up, as you say, Hallie? And uh, yeah, Neil, what did it unlock for you guys in terms of what you could make the player confront within themselves? I mean, it's so fucking hard. It's such a hard thing to try and do, right? It's like you have, we've given you a very um, familiar structure. Someone is, someone we love is terribly wronged in a Western style structure and they're going to go and get revenge. And we all love a good revenge story, right? Like fuck the other guy. We're on our, our guy's team. They're going to get the shit kicked out of them. And we're going to just see how long they're willing to latch on to this, to this vengeance quest. So that's a thing that we're familiar with. So then to, to invert that, to subvert that trope and then have to do all the heavy lifting of like, we wanted you to feel super biased. We wanted you to feel exactly what Ellie was feeling in the sense of tribalism and then go, but wait, maybe there are nice guys on both teams. Like, <laughs> you know, the just the the creative exercise of doing that without trying to do any big cheats without trying to do any like but wait look she's actually caring for her like cancer ridden father and it's all you know like you know we're just trying to say this is who she authentically is and she's got good and bad and we're not going to sugarcoat any of it we're not going to make her a saint i don't know to me that's that's thrilling that's that's super super hard but you know we should be pushing ourselves professionally shouldn't we yeah, I guess I guess for me, it was try, it was trying to replicate, um, you know, my journey of growing up, and uh, you know, I talked about conflict of where I come from and seeing it in this very simplistic, one sided way. And then as I got older and did more research and talked to more people, I was like un understanding the nuances more and more and more. And it felt like, um, you know, especially this this series has dealt with mature subject matter and and, and dealt with universal themes of of love. And, you know, in the first game, we explored um, the the most beautiful and the most horrific aspects of love. Of it, it could lead you to like protect the child at any cost. And it could also lead you to damn all of mankind because of that same love. And realizing that there's another aspect of love we didn't 
really explore in the first game, which is this idea of hate and some of the worst atrocities that we as a species have ever committed have been in the name of love, have been in the name of protecting our tribe versus the other tribe. Um, and I just felt like, especially, you know, like I think now with social media and the way like things are discussed, it's like you, you see these groups and you see the tribalism happening on different levels, not just governmental levels. So it felt like an important story for us to explore. It's a sort of therapy for us as, as we're building it and crafting it to then look at a conflict that again, initially appears simplistic. And then like, let's put you in the shoes of the other side and, and knowing it's going to be uncomfortable for some people, knowing that some people are just not going to buy into it. Cause for right. We have different moral values and, and how we look at justice. And for some people, like once you've committed a certain act, there's no coming back. There is never like, you can't do anything to redeem yourself. And we wanted to just, again, without preaching without saying, okay, here's how we believe about capital, what we think about capital punishment or anything, and just explore characters that feel differently about these moral quandaries. And um, and I, I like I, the thing we always say, it's, it's so simple, but it's like, let's make the game we want to play. Uh, and then right us as a group talking about it, trying to imagine like someone else making this kind of game. And then the middle, like you have this character that you hate and like all of a sudden, like I'm, I have to be in their shoes and walk around with them and like empathize with them and see like how they live. Like that sounded so exciting to me. I was like, I would love to play that game. And like, I, it's not, I, I want more games like that out there. So fuck it, let's make it. Um, and uh, you know, throw caution to the wind, knowing like this is a sequel and people have certain expectations or what they want to see of these characters and say, nothing here is precious uh, except for the theme, except for like, you know, the message we're trying to explore. We have to do it. This is another Robert McKee thing, which is like, uh, he talks about that you have no obligation to tell a moral story, to tell a good story. Your only obligation is to tell an honest story. Mm. And that's the thing we constantly like held ourselves to is like, are we being honest to this world, to our themes and to our characters? And if not, then it has to change. Um, and there were cool ideas that we had to throw away because they just didn't feel honest or they didn't feel authentic to the experience we're after. What were some of those ideas that had to be sidelined? Um, so one idea, like we mentioned earlier, was Ellie killing Abby. Um, mm -hmm. That the way it used to play out is like you would kill Abby and then like Ellie would return to the farm and it, there were there different versions, but there would be someone there, someone you didn't even know that's there to get revenge on you based on like Yara dying or some, some other side character dying. It's like their relative. It was just, and it was to speak again to the cycle. And then that person stops the cycle. They're there like to torture and make Ellie suffer. And they realize it's just a kid and they let you go and walk out so one, it just didn't feel active to the characters we're playing with. It feels like, oh, someone outside of our story is making the final decision. Um, and then the other one is like, the more we talked about Ellie is like, even though she does the wrong things, her intention is good. Right? It's like, she's not this evil mustache twirling person of like, I just want to kill as many people as possible for no reason. And it's like, once you, we felt like we gave her enough data enough of things with like abby and lev and her relationship with joel and realization she has about that there's enough things there that i was like that's the thing we're bumping up against i think that's why the ending we kept going back to it and changing it something just wasn't working for us it was like we weren't being true to who ellie really is uh and that's when we like as soon as we said it out loud as soon as the words say like what if she didn't kill Abby? I remember like in that meeting I was with Hallie because we're brainstorming about something else and and she's like oh wait that's an option Okay, well, hold on. Let's just let's just rethink everything. Uh, and then that just it was right away, like within that meeting, within that hour. Right, we've been working on this other ending for months, and then within that hour, as soon as we said it out loud, like Ellie doesn't kill Abby, he's like, yes, that's way more honest. It's going to be way more work to rejig everything to get to that point. Um, but everyone was on board because it just felt like the right thing, despite the journey that Ellie's been on. That ultimately, um, she has a in her to like let this person go 
And you mentioned not being precious. I mean, nothing illustrates the lack of preciousness on your part, like Joel's death in this story, which um, is a, it's a heartbreaking scene. The execution of this plot point is so important to understanding it and being able to embrace it. But as we touched on at the beginning, you were robbed of being able to let people discover that moment in the right context, the context that makes the moment work because of that unfortunate hack. Um, that's been covered before, but I do want to delve into this moment in the story, Joel's death. There's such brutality and lack of ceremony to that scene. Our hero from the previous game doesn't get to go out in a moment of heroic sacrifice. He goes out in the same senseless way that most people die in the world of Last of Us, which felt like a very purposeful choice. Um, can you talk me through not just the decision to have Joel die, but the execution? How you wove in that sense of dread and disgust that fills the scene? Yeah, uh, from the get-go, all of our discussions were like, he, he can't go out in a blaze of glory um, because we this is not that kind of story. Uh, and, and our story is more grounded than that. And, you know, in, in a violent reality, people just go out like that off of like a bomb going off. They're a, stolen. A stray, yeah. A stray gunshot. Like they fall off a building. Like, um, so we knew it had to be, yeah, I didn't want it to be heroic. I didn't want him to be Iron Man snapping his fingers and saving the world or like getting bitten and saving Ellie. And, uh, and, and I know a lot of people wanted that and I get what, why they wanted that. Like I've experienced a lot of stories like that that have been very satisfying. It's just not what we were going for. Uh, it's not what I ever saw the franchise as. Um, and then you're right. There was There was like an aspect of like we needed you to – be disgusted by what's happening because we need you to feel all this hate towards this group that committed this act. Um, and that's where it's like, it, it couldn't, it, so constraints we gave ourselves, like it can't be quick. Uh, it can't be painless. And there's, there's gotta be like an aspect. It's gotta be almost a little humiliating as well. Just the, the situation, like that's where him getting spit on um, came like, and then our job was to justify, like, how could these people feel so much hate for this man that makes you feel they're a bunch of animals? Uh, who else but a bunch of animals could commit such a horrible, heinous act? Um, and yet, then you go on this journey to do the same thing and you rationalize it and you justify it in the way that we do in our real life, that, like, we'll look at some other group doing something and, like, that's horrible, Let's do it back to them. And you hear that over and over again um, as you listen to like different conflicts that, that, that they go in the world. And it was important for us to capture just the unceremonious way people die um, and then to make you go through those, those very specific emotions. Mm. And it happens so early in the game, which gives... I mean, a, a bit in a, if we had all the time in the world, I'd love to hear about the, uh, you know, all those scenes later on in the game, for example, when they go to the dinosaur museum, they have so much weight and so much gravity to them because of the fact that we've seen him die and that happened so early on in the game. But as we are short for time, I'll skip ahead to the ending because um, there's a lot to discuss here. Um, Hallie, you had a draft in which Ellie, right at the very end of the game, having not killed Abby, uh, she picks up one of JJ's toys when she's back on the farm and she puts it in her bag before wandering off. Now, this gives mm -hmm. a very much more definitive ending, a sense that Ellie was heading back into Jackson to try and, you know, uh, reignite her relationship with Dina. That came out. Like, why did that come out in favour of an ending that's much more open to interpretation? And and how 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 did you guys, uh, you know, what were the battles that led to that decision? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps battles is... I, I, think, I think Neil ultimate. might actually... <laughs> be better to to answer this question. Um, yeah, I I liked the idea that we had some uh, whiff of whiff of lesson learned on some level, whiff of whiff of shift of value sets. Right. So Ellie has forsaken because of her addiction to this. Right. She has, without really intending to, forsaken her family, and this idea that like, okay, maybe she has learned that that was the sort of true, true rebirth for her. And she's going to go do that. Um, but I think Neil will say that that <laughs> felt too, uh, too definitive, too, too clear cut to say like, oh yeah, she's, that's exactly who she is. And she's off and she's got another mission. You know, I think there was, 
more of a need for reflection. But I'll let Neil answer for himself now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I guess, uh, again, this franchise is different from Uncharted, different other kind of story that I think would require a more definitive ending. Um, right, so kind of like tone, I think, dictates ambiguity to some 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 degree. Um, and it, it it just happens like that one just felt a little too specific. I, for, for me, is like as soon as she picked up the toys, like she's going back to Dina and JJ. Like, I don't know how to interpret that. I guess you could, right? You could say she's just t- taking it as like a keepsake. She wants to remember them. She's going somewhere else. But it was important for me to keep it kind of vague of like that question of like, yes, she saved a bit of her humanity in sparing Abby. But where do you go from here after you've, you yourself have committed so many atrocities? Uh, and I think that's a struggle. And I don't know if there's one definitive answer. And I wanted to, um, I think we all came to that same conclusion. I was like, wanted to like, um, leave it more ambiguous of where, where does Ellie go from here? Mm. Yeah, you start to sort of talk about what that like next scene would be, like what she does actually do. And you're like, oh, I don't know. I maybe, maybe there are some really cool alternative paths for her. And how much have you guys been thinking about what some of those alternative paths might be and where she goes from here? Because, well, Neil, you mentioned after the game's release that to justify making a part two, we had to do something not that the fans would be comfortable with, but something that would match the emotional core we found in the first game. And without that, there'd be no reason to do a part three. Almost a year down the line now, have you found or began looking for that justification at all? How often do you, how much time have you spent thinking about what might happen next? Um, quite a bit. Uh, you know, when, when we, f- these games take so much to make, um, you know, this one, been thinking about it for seven years between the when the last game came out and then when this one came out, but, you know, actively full production working on it for four plus years. Uh, but you want to make sure you're jazzed by the idea that you have. It feels like it's challenging. It's It feels, we've now had two games that I feel like, you know, speak to something universal as well as telling a very personal story for these characters that, uh, that, that now there's, now like, with one, like with one game, there's no like pattern of what a franchise is. With two games, now there's starting to be a pattern. And like now I feel like there's certain structural thematic themes you would have to stick to if you're making a third game. Uh, so, yeah, so I would say we, after we finish kind of like our big, one of our big titles, it's like we take a long time to explore different ideas, whether it's going to be Last of Us 3, whether it's something new, whether... Um, there's some old franchise we want to go back to. And then like, we really have to, I, I like to fully explore all those fully and then look at like, okay, we have all these ideas in front of us as a studio. What do we want to commit to? Cause that's a huge commitment. It's a huge, like monetary time, passion, talent. Um, so you think about all the opportunity costs that comes to that. And um, I don't know how much I want to reveal, uh, we Hallie and I did write an outline for a story um, that we're not making, <laughs> uh, but I hope one day can see the light of day that explores a little bit uh, what happens after this game. But um, we'll see. This is the cook the baby one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is the one we're like, how do we top Last of Us Two? All right, we can cook babies. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, <Exciting>. spoilers. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I. It sounds like, you know, your instinct at the moment is there may well be more Last of Us beyond, of course, the TV adaptation that you're working on with the aforementioned Craig Mazin. Um, How is the uh, TV show coming along and and what can you tell me about the tone and the amazing cast that you guys have put together? It's such a fascinating uh, process because um, it's a different creative group, you know, than the one that made the games. Um, So they're... Craig and the other actors and even some of the producers um, are bringing their own sensibilities. Um, Craig in particular is a huge gamer, love, love this game so much and understands like these characters so fully. Uh, so it's like the, the, the tone is interesting because um, unlike, let's say when I worked on the movie version where like a lot of the, the big, the thinking and the notes were like, how do we make it bigger? How do you make the set pieces bigger? And it's like, when we made the game and it didn't work for the last of us. And that's why I think ultimately the movie wasn't made um, because we are, our approach for the last of us, like, let's make it 
and as an indie film. Obviously, in games, just doing any kind of human characters and realistic cloth and the animation that we do and the fidelity that we do makes it very, very expensive. But let's approach it as if it's like an indie film team, the way it's shot, the way how small it and intimate it feels. Obviously, it's like there's a lot of world building. And with the show, we get to lean into that even more because we don't have to have as many action sequences as we do in the game. Because in the game, there's certain mechanics for pacing purposes. You have to like engage those mechanics every once in a while. You need enough um, uh, combat to train those mechanics. You need to, fl- and you can throw all that out. You're like, okay, now we're in a different medium. Let's play to the strengths of this medium. Uh, and that's been really fun to explore um, with other people and seeing how they interpret their material and reinterpret some of the material uh, in really fascinating ways and are using the the structure of The Last of Us, you know, the, 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 the underpinnings of it are all there and telling slightly different stories and the characters are shifting and evolving based on this other medium, based on the fact that there's other creatives working on it. Um, and I'm really excited for it because I think it's going to be really good. Like every every choice we're making, every new director we're bringing up on board is like someone we really admire. Like, oh my God, we get to work with this amazing filmmaker to work on like these episodes. Um, and I'm just really excited to see it come together. Well, I can't wait for it. And uh, yeah, guys, this has been so much fun. It's been fascinating uh, delving into this incredible game with you both. Thanks so much for coming on the show. You both inflicted some pretty serious trauma on me with this game, specifically the <laughs> Rat King scene. But you've been such a yes. great guest. We're even now. I'm willing to call it even. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. <the> <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Kamal Demek, with music from Stefan Bindley Taylor. Get in touch. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, or you can email us, thescriptapartpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.